got another video for the A-level chemistry multiple choice practice. So this is the fourth one for inorganic and physical. Remember, there's a separate playlist for organic chemistry if you wanted to check that one out as well. Hope you like the video. If you haven't already subscribed, why don't you consider subscribing to the channel? And as always, the link to the questions in the description of the video if you want to try it first. Okay, so make a start. So we'll just run through each of the four scenarios and see which one would generate a smaller titra. So the first one, the burette readings are taken from the top of the meniscus instead of the bottom of the meniscus. Now remember, a titra is all about the difference between the initial reading on the burette and the final reading on the burette. The standard practice is to measure from the bottom of the meniscus. But if you measure from the top, so long as you're consistent and you do both readings from the top, the difference is going to be the same. So that will not alter the titer. So I'll just put a cross through A. Moving on to B. So if this conical flask was rinsed with water before doing the titration, if you're putting the same volume and concentration of sodium hydroxide in here, you put in exactly the same number of moles of sodium hydroxide in there, and so therefore the titra will be exactly the same. So B is not right. Moving on to statement C, so you'll notice I've shaded in this part of the burette just to represent an air bubble. And what that's doing is that's taking up space in the burette. So there should really be acid in there, but it's not. It's uh, air and it's forced the meniscus higher than it should be. So as the titration takes place, the air bubble is going to be released from the burette. The meniscus is going to drop, so it looks like acid's gone into the conical flask, but it hasn't. So to neutralize this set volume of sodium hydroxide, it's going to look like you've used more acid than you actually have. So the titra would actually look bigger. So that one's wrong. So that means D must be the right answer. I'll just quickly explain why. Sorry, I don't have a picture of a pipette, but I'm sure you can visualize this one. So if you're into pipette with water before you put the sodium hydroxide in, there'll be a tiny amount of water left in the pipette. That'll take up some space. So the, there'll be less sodium hydroxide actually going into the pipette, which means less sodium hydroxide is going to be in this conical flask, which means you're not going to need as much acid from the burette to neutralize it. Number two, which statement gives a numerical value of the Avogadro's constant? So which one's going to give us an answer of 6.02 times 10 to the 23? Statement A is not right because 12 grams of carbon-12 is one mole, not that many moles. Statement B, I'll explain down here. So 20.05 grams of calcium is 0.5 moles. So if you think about any reaction involving calcium, each atom will lose two electrons. So half a mole of atoms is actually going to mean there's one mole of electrons being lost but it says the number of electrons, so one mole of electrons is 6.02 times 10 to the 23 electrons. So B was correct. Just for revision, I'll explain why C and D are wrong. So C, 16 grams of oxygen is half a mole of O2, which is therefore half of Avogadro's number O2 molecules. And D is wrong because if you have one mole of chlorine molecules, you've actually got two moles of atoms. So that's two times Avogadro's number of atoms, which is that. Moving on to number three. So this is like a reverse empirical formula calculation because we, we already know what the ratio is. So I'm starting with my table for the X and O atoms. I've got my masses in. So the first thing I'm going to do is divide the O by 16 to see how many moles of oxygen atoms we've got. So that's 0 0.025 moles. We know the ratio is two to three. So to get the actual moles of X, I need to multiply this by two over three. So that gives us 0 0.0167. We know the mass, we know the moles, so we can work out the MR. 
MR comes out at 48, just mass over moles. So we just look at these, which one's got an MR of 48? And the answer is titanium, so it was B. Number four, we need to know the ratio between the calcium hydroxide and the phosphoric acid in the reaction. So this has got two moles of hydroxide ions in per mole of calcium hydroxide. And this, because it's tribasic, it's got three moles of H plus ions. So basically we need to get those OH minus ions and H plus ions the same. So we're going to multiply that by three and that by two. So that's going to give us six of each. So we'll quickly work out the moles of phosphoric acid. Concentration times volume gives 0 0.01. So the moles of calcium hydroxide that you would need would be three over two times that. So that's going to be 0 0.015. And now we just need to convert those moles into grams. So the mass of CaOH twice is moles times MR. And when you put the numbers in, you get C as your answer. Moving on to question five. So statement A, is that correct? Chromium atoms have electron configuration of that. Remember, chromium is one of the weird ones. It doesn't follow the usual pattern in the electron configuration. So that is actually correct. So that was quite nice of the exam board to make the first option the right answer. And just for revision purposes, I'll just run through why B, C and D are wrong. So a couple one plus ions have the configuration 3D10. So that's a complete 3D subshell. Ion two plus ions have one, two, three, four unpaired electrons. And scandium only forms three plus ions. So it doesn't form um, ions with different oxidation states. Moving on to number six, we haven't got time to draw a cycle. Remember, we've got 80 seconds to do these. So the method we're going to use, the formula we're going to use, is dictated by what type of data we're using. So these are enthalpy changes of formation. So it's products minus reactants. So putting the numbers in, we get that. And when you do the calculation, you get minus 3914. So the answer was A. Moving on to number seven, so I've already drawn up the profile of the Boltzmann curve at a higher temperature. So you can see the peak does not increase in height, it's actually lower. So we're down to C or D, and you can see again from the profile it's shifted to the right. Number eight, obviously testing your knowledge of the Arrhenius equation. So there it is there. I always write it out in this form, the Lin version, because it's easy to see the Y equals MX plus C um, aspects to it. So this minus AA over R is the gradient. So that means minus AA over R equals minus 55,000. First thing I'm gonna do is get rid of the minus signs because I've got one on each side. And then to calculate EA, we're gonna multiply 55,000 by R. So 55,000 times 8.314 gives 457270 joules per mole. So we'll divide that by 1,000 to put it into kilojoules per mole, which gives option D. Moving on to number 9. So the total pressure is equal to the sum of the partial pressures. So that means 25. The total pressure is equal to these two plus the partial pressure of the ammonia. So we'll just solve for that partial pressure comes out at 3.75 and what we're going to do now is feed those numbers these partial pressures into the kp expression to calculate kp so there's the numbers when you do the calculation you get 0 0.048 so option b was the right answer moving on to number 10 so i've written down overall order in units so i'll just quickly explain that so if we think about how we calculate K or the units for K, so it's rate over the concentration raised to the overall order power. So to get these units here for this rate constant, this power here, this X needs to be two. I'll just explain that one. So because we've got moles per decimeter cubed squared on the bottom, what that means is that can cancel the moles and the DM to the minus three on the top with one lot of those on the bottom so that would go down to a one and then if we take the denominator units up to the top we're going to get dm to the three because it's one over dm to the minus three at the moment 
molten minus one, s to the minus one. So second order overall, C. Number 11, so all I've done is in the beaker here, this is just representing the beaker that this has taken place in. We've got 20 cm cubed of that concentration of HCl. So concentration times volume means there's that many moles of H plus. And concentration times volume of the NaOH means there's that many moles of OH minus. So you can see the H plus is in excess. 0.01 moles of H plus will react away. So that means at the end of the reaction, you're going to be left with 0.01 moles of H plus, And the total volume is the combined volume of the solutions, 10 and 20 cm cubed, 30 cm cubed. So now we need to turn that into an H plus concentration. That's just moles over volume. We get 0.03 recurring moles per decimeter cubed. And now we need to minus log that, which gives 1.48. So the answer was D. Number 12 is pretty tricky. I think there's been quite a few tricky questions on this one so far. I don't know what you think. But anyway, the first thing I'm going to do is work out the oxidation number changes for the iodine and the manganese. So iodine starts at minus 1, goes up to plus 1. So that's a change of 2. The Mn goes from plus 7 down to plus 4. So that's a change of 3. So the rule in redox reactions is the overall increase of oxidation but has to equal the overall decrease. So basically we need to get these both to six. So that means we need threes in front of the I species and twos in front of the MN species. Now we're going to balance the OH minus ions. So we do that so that the charges are the same left and right. So at the moment we've got three minus, two minus, so we've got five minus on the left We've only got three minus at the moment on the right. So I need another two minus from my hydroxide ions. I'm not going to bother balancing the H2O. We don't need to because there's the ratio we're after there. Two to two, so one to one. So C. So well done if you got that one right. I think that's tricky. Moving up number 13. So which statements are correct when a catalyst is added to a system in dynamic equilibrium? Number one, rate of forward and reverse reactions increased by the same amount. Yep, that's right. Two, concentrations of reactants and products don't change. That's also correct. Three, value of Kc increases. Nope, that one's wrong because temperature is the only thing that will change Kc. So one and two only, B was right. Number 14, so testing the statements again to see which ones are correct. Second ionisation energy of magnesium greater than the second ionisation energy of calcium. That's correct because magnesium is higher up the group. So to remove its second electron, it's going to take more energy than calcium's. So we're correct for that one. Number two, strontium two plus ion contains six electrons in S orbitals. So a strontium atom, it's in period five. So you've got um, S electrons in 1S through to 5S. So when it forms its um, 2 plus ion, we're going to lose those. So this one's got 8 electrons in S orbitals. So that's wrong. Number 3, is that the right equation for bearing with water? No, it's not because the formula of barium hydroxide is wrong. It should be BaOH twice. So only one was correct. So D is the answer. Moving on to number 15, so I'll just use this simplified um, diagram of the complex to explain these. So does it have cis trans isomers? No, it can't because all the ligands are exactly the same. So that one's wrong. It has optical isomers. So that one's correct because the mirror image of this isn't superimposable onto this. And statement three is correct because it does have sixfold coordination Coordination number is all about the number of coordinate bonds going to the central metal ion, and there are six. So that was correct. So two and three, right? C.